Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Just, just adjusting my legs. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fergie and Darlene. My name is Tom, and I am an alcoholic. I belong to the Green Acres group of AA in Lethbridge. I also belong to the Adam group of Al-Anon. I would like to thank all the members of the committee for inviting me here to speak this evening. And in particular, I would like to thank Kelly for picking me up and driving me straight to the Roundup. And uh, uh, to Diane... Uh, who has spoken to me several times, and for that lovely gift of a basket of fruit in my room, it's kept me alive for the last 24 hours. I'm still nervous doing this. I've been doing a lot of uh, traveling recently. Um, I was in San Francisco just before the earthquake, and then I flew over to uh, New York, and then I was back in Washington two weekends ago, and I was speaking there with two of the giants of Alcoholics Anonymous, C.C. of uh, Prince Albert and uh, Franklin from Mississippi. The two of them, between them, have over 70 years sobriety, and that was a hard act to follow. Now, I have to explain to you that they hold the Mount Baker roundup, this is a typical alcoholic, in Mount Vernon. So C.C. came all the way from Saskatchewan, and he drove right to the top of Mount Baker looking for the roundup, and it's a long way away. And I told him that's probably the closest he's ever been to his higher power since he's been in the program. <laughs> it also makes me happy to speak in Canada because I'm fed up uh, going down there and trading in my hard-earned dollars for 80 cents. <laughs> and that's a real act of humility, and I know you all share that uh, with me. You know, Cease isn't the only spiritual leader uh, who got lost on his way coming west. When Fulton Sheen was the the great uh, director on television and spiritual leader of the United States, he came to a small town in the Midwest, and he was looking for the town hall. And he met a bunch of kids, and he said to this little boy, "Um, where is your town hall? And the little fellow said, why? And he said, well... He said, I'm going there to speak to all of the people in the town tonight. And uh, he said, what are you going to tell them? He said, well, I've come here to tell them all how to get to heaven. And the little fellow looked up at him and shook his head and he said, my God, and you can't even find our town hall? (laughs) When you go down to the United States and introduce you as Dr. Tom, uh, everybody asks you what kind of doctor you are. You know, and one of the ladies, we all make assumptions, and one of the ladies came up to me and uh, I said, well, what kind of doctor do you think I am? And she looked at me for a while and she said, I think you're a vet. And I said, and I said well, I've made these kinds of assumptions before. I'm actually a surgeon. And uh, I said I had a man in my office not so long ago and uh, he was 64 years old. And I said to him, uh, what did your father die of? And he said, who told you my father died? He said, <laughs> said my father's 81 and he's in perfect health. I said, I'm very sorry. I said, what did your grandfather die of? He said, who told you my grandfather's dead? He said, he's 99 years old and got married last Tuesday. <laughs> and I said, good Lord. I said, Why, what, what would make a man of uh, uh, 99 years old want to get married? He said, who told you he wanted to get married? <laughs> I'm, I'm not a dentist, and I'm not, thank God, a gynecologist. A, a dentist friend of mine said to me the other day, he had a lady come into his office, and she was the most petrified he'd ever seen. She was shaking in the chair, and he said, what's wrong with you? And she said, well, I don't know what scares me more, having these teeth done or getting pregnant. He said, well, I wish you'd make up your mind before I adjust the position of the chair. Now, there are many 
many forms, many forms of addiction, and I see some of you out there who join me at Castlegar, and they know Mike in Castlegar, and he's, uh, not like Grace was complaining about all these AA meetings, he's an addicted golfer, and he golfs with the same people every morning, and the uh, devoted husband, he always arrives home for lunch. Uh, but this day he didn't arrive home, and his wife got really worried about him. And uh, finally he came in about 6.30 at night, and she said, where have you been? And he said, well, I have to be honest with you, I played 18 holes of golf, was driving down the road and saw this pretty girl beside a broken down car. He said, and I tried to fix it, and then I took her in my car, and we talked a while, and one thing led to another, he said, and to tell you the truth, dear, I took her to a motel, and we've been in a motel all afternoon, and she said, you filthy liar, you played another 18 holes of golf, didn't you? <laughs> It's always, it's always a pleasure for me to come here and speak to the 4-H club, that's the heaves, the hives, the hallucinations and the hemorrhoid group. <laughs> but I always have this problem, and uh, as you see, it's my height, and uh, I always worry, first of all, can anybody see me, so I bring a box, and then if you can see me, I wonder if you can hear me. And if you can hear me, I don't know if you can understand me. Because you know there are two official languages in this country, and it's obvious to you now that I don't speak either one of them. <laughs> I, was born, I was born in Scotland, and I'm half Irish and I'm half Scots. <laughs> Well, that, that really is a dilemma because one half of you wants to get drunk all the time and the other half won't pay for it. <laughs> well, as you're, as you're probably aware, uh, the Irish uh, are a strange uh, race of uh, people. Louis McNeese once said they're, they're a race of people who shoot straight in the cause of crooked thinking. Uh, and that maybe accounts for their alcoholism. And they're a very vengeful bunch. Um, I'm, rem I'm always reminded of the story of the Irish farmer who was plowing his field and a little leprechaun jumped out. And he said, Begora, he said, I didn't believe you little people really existed. He said, oh, we do. And uh, what's more... I can grant you any wish you want in the world, he said, anything. Wealth, power, property, there's only one condition. He said, if I give it to you, your neighbor Murphy over in the next farm will get double what you get. Well, that worried, he scratched his head for a little while and he said, Murphy gets double. He said, is it very painful to have one testicle removed? <laughs> This is the end of the spiritual part of the meeting so far. <laughs> and I want to talk to you about the family disease of alcoholism. I am a doctor and I'm totally convinced that uh, this is indeed a disease. It's a family disease as we've heard about today. I know there's, there's very uh, abundant proof today that people, many, but not all, Alcoholics are biogenetically, hereditarily set up to become alcoholics. And I know that the children of alcoholics even separated at birth are four or five times more likely to become alcoholic. And that would be a very depressing thought for me to pass on to you tonight if I didn't have the faith in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and if I didn't know that we can create an environment 
in which our children and our children's children will hopefully recover from that seemingly impossible state of mind and body. As far as my own family was concerned, my father was a coal miner in Scotland after the war, and we lived at the pinnacle of poverty. He was earning about $50 a week. There were four children. He was never an alcoholic. My mother wasn't an alcoholic. My grandfather lived with us, and he wasn't an alcoholic. But my uncles were all alcoholics. All the uncles and that I met at the funeral of my father uh, were all alcoholic, and one died very young, as we again heard today, of the disease of alcoholism. My older brother suffers from alcoholism all these years since high school, and uh, he's recently had uh, uh, two severe heart attacks, and uh, and at, at the last time I heard, he was uh, having some temporary sobriety. My younger brother's an alcoholic, and I'll talk about him later on. Do you know, in fact, when I think of the little village that I grew up in, the whole village was alcoholic. I took my son home, and they all they were all falling down drunk. It seemed to be the way of life where I lived. My son walked into a, uh, into a restaurant, and everybody in that room was paralytic drunk, and he couldn't believe it. It was a way of life there. And we used to joke and say the only difference between a wedding in this town and a funeral is one less drunk. And it was the truth. It was the truth. And I don't know if it's changed uh, very much. There was a religious civil war going on in this town because it was half Catholic and half Protestant. And uh, this caused all sorts of calamities, you know. I was born a little Catholic, and uh, I went to Catholic school. When I was about 16, uh, my motorcycle broke down on the wrong side of town uh, for me because there were a whole host of drunken people, and they were all Irish Catholic laborers. And uh, I was a little fellow, as you gather, and they came over and they said, let's kick the you-know-what out of this little filthy Protestant. And before I could make the sign of the cross, they did it. (laughs) And they left me lying for dead in the sidewalk. So I wasn't very impressed with things religious as I grew up. And as I went to school, I heard about a God, a vengeful God. I may have misinterpreted it, but I can only tell you what my memories were a vengeful God, that I had to be perfect to be acceptable to this God. And I heard a lot about God's will. I loved my grandfather very much. And we spoke into the small hours of the morning. And when he died, and I was young, they said, it's God's will. And then a child in our family died. And it was God's will. And every calamity that seemed to come along, uh, this is Remembrance Day, and two of my favorite... uh, Uncles uh, were young pilots, uh, Andrew and Joe, and they both went down as young university students, went on to be pilots, and both died in the war. And that was God's will. So I made some kind of decision that I'd better keep uh, some distance away from this God character. And I shoved them way on the back burner of my life for a long, long time. You know, if you if you had asked me at that time what were my assets and liabilities in high school, I would have told you my liabilities were the poverty that I've described, and I would have told you, um, and my height, I thought was a terrible liability. You know, the kids at school used to say things like, Tom Melling's so small, he's just a waste of good skin. <laughs> and you, I don't think that's very funny. But my biggest asset, everybody was telling me how intelligent I was. And all the teachers were patting me in the head, accelerating me through school. That didn't help my growth any. And I went right through high school at the age of 15. I was too young to go into university. I waited for a year. I went to university at the age of 16. And at a young age, I decided I wanted to become a doctor. And it seemed ridiculous. But I did go on 
to do that medical degree. And I did take on this attitude that I was going to win in life the smart way, the education way, the degree trail. And I did go on to get degree after degree after degree, surgery degrees and everything. Some people say they're born alcoholics, and I say I became an alcoholic by degrees. <laughs> but Father, Father Martin uh, met me young in my sobriety, and he said, you've heard the story, many of you, thermometers have degrees too, and you know where they can stick those, Tom. <laughs> they're, they're, very, they're very kind to you when you come into Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> well, I married about this time, when I qualified as a doctor, and I married a beautiful young girl, and she was the daughter of the principal of the high school, very happy, never saw any alcoholism in her life. And uh, we got married just shortly before I was drafted into the army. And I was sent over to Cyprus when the conflict was going on in Cyprus. And I didn't see her for a year. And I saw lots of kids being blown to bits and killed. And we did surgery one night, and we drank the next night. We did surgery the next night with a team of, you know, I was pretty junior. But in any case, uh, this developed, I was 26 years old, and this is when I started to drink. And that's what makes me so happy to see people here, an Alcoholics Anonymous, long before I even started to drink. So, my wife... My son was born over there, my first son. And over that two the years, she came to join me. And before we went back to Scotland, she watched me develop into this budding, raving, stupid alcoholic. And she was a very sick, disillusioned young woman when she brought that baby home to Scotland. And I said, well, it's going to change. It's geographic. That was a tough little time. And I'll go back and I'll train as a surgeon. And I did, and I got my fellowship in surgery in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and I, I had another two sons born after that, and I kept drinking, and it got worse, and I was no father to these kids at all. She did everything, and I know where the resentments come from, uh, because I lived to, did my job, and I drank, and I, and I made that girl's life an absolute and utter hell. I looked in a magazine one day and it said they were looking for a surgeon in Lethbridge, Alberta. And it described this, and I'm a romantic, you see, the Rocky Mountains and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police <laughs> and Nelson Eddy, Jeanette MacDonald. <laughs> Pictures of all this all floated before my eyes and I said, that's the answer. My wife heard that the bars were separated, men and women at that time, and she thought that was a pretty good idea. <laughs> and uh, so we all packed up bag and baggage, and we came to Canada to drink Canada dry. <laughs> and I, I moved into Lethbridge to those unsuspecting souls, and here I was trying to build up a practice of alcohol, uh, a practice of surgery. <laughs> I got that one right. I was trying to set up a practice in surgery uh, in act of alcoholism, and that's not easy. I did nearly all of my drinking in the 60s, the worst of it. And Robin Williams if, has said that if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> and I wasn't there all of the 60s. They were tough times. But I want to say to the newcomers coming to this fellowship, and I think it's really important, that I know I did many, many good things while I was a practicing alcoholic. I know I achieved many goals. I did many kindnesses to people. I tried my best, and I couldn't love my wife or my children. I was an incapable person of giving or receiving any love. I did the best I could with what I had. And it's not all bad. You see, people come into the fellowship, 
and they feel like the hole in the donut and they're no use and they've never done anything good in their life and I can identify with that. But I want you to remember, the, I want you to remember the, some of the good in you. And now I want to tell you some of the useless things that brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know about you, but I was a very unlucky drinker. I seemed to get into accidents all the time. And I fractured my arm three times, and I compound fractured my right leg, fractured my ribs, fractured my spine. Had so many accidents, I kept two cars, one for the body shop. <laughs> and uh, I tell you, this was quite a mess. I sometimes was a traveling drunk. I went downtown one day and you'll know the feeling. Nothing's right about the town. Nothing's good about the family. Nothing's good about Lethbridge. To hell with it all. And I went into the bank, borrowed some money. No idea where I was going and I woke up in London, England, unshaven. And they thought Santa Claus had come. Because I went into all the bars in London and I was buying drinks for everybody till the money ran out and then I came back again. I went downtown in Lethbridge once for a quiet refreshment to the dirtiest, filthiest hotel that's torn down and that's where I'd reached, the Garden Hotel. And I tripped going in there. I was a falling down drunk, you know. And I tripped going into the toilet and you won't believe I went over the back of the toilet bowl head first and I got stuck upside down in the corner behind the toilet bowl <laughs> with my arms beset on my side and my legs kicking in the air and the more I kicked there, the more I got impacted in that ridiculous situation. And I'm saying to myself, you know, why don't they get a better janitorial service in this way? <laughs> and, you know, and what's a man in your position, doing in this position. <laughs> because it was certainly not, it certainly wasn't an, il an illustrious start to be a surgeon. In fact, as you know, I was a laughing stock of the town about this stage. I met a young man down in Montana and he told me, as somebody did today, don't forget to tell them about falling in the toilet. I like that story. And I was rambling along like this and then I saw him out there, and I said, I'd almost forgotten about falling in the toilet till I saw your face. <laughs> well, I surely to God hope you're still in the fellowship. When I was, when I was drinking there one night, I had a, I crashed into a parked car in Lethbridge and I took off. The police caught me. I was brought before the judge. And uh, he said to me, you know, Tom, if I take you out into the open court, you're going to lose your license. The game's up. He said, I'm going to be kind to you. He said, and I'm going to hear your case in my private chamber and you find me and the costs and all that sort of thing. And I told you I'm really intelligent. So I walked, he said, I hope that teaches you a lesson. I walked out of that judge's office, and you know what I thought? I've got this whole town in my pocket. I've got, I've got the judge, the chief of police, I got the thing, and I went straight to the bar. I'm happy to tell you that I went to an AA meeting many years later, and into that room in North Lethbridge walked the barman who served me the drinks, the policeman who arrested me, and who walked in but the judge? <laughs> and every one of us made it to the fellowship and the judge passed away down east not so long ago. In 1969, my daughter was born and I decided to go down to... I, I had some self-imposed sobriety. I decided to quit drinking and I stopped for a couple of months. And I went down to Toronto and I wrote the examinations and studied and wrote the examinations for the Canadian Fellowship as a surgeon. And I passed the stupid exam. And I was so happy about it, 
I got so drunk in Toronto that I went onto the plane as a passenger and they threw me off with the baggage in Calgary. I was so drunk. And uh, here I was back, right back into my own cycle. You know, my wife had left me once or twice during this time. She took the children all to England at one time. And I'm making light, you know, of a really miserable, sick situation, as you very well appreciate. And I I cajoled her, and she came back. And uh, here I was, and I wasn't drinking. The white knuckle misery. And uh, one day she said to me, she never had any Alan on, she said, you're doing so well now, Tom, that you could maybe handle a little wine with your meals, you know, when we're out to dinner. Well, boom, light bulb in head. Tom was drinking wine morning, noon, and night in bed. She, she just couldn't cook fast enough. <laughs> and I was really back to this, so I said, let's try something else. I said, I've got to discipline myself from the outside. I've got to get too busy to drink. So I ran for the school board. I got elected. I ran for the, 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 the um, president of the medical association and I was, I was elected and I was on this, I was on so many committees I thought I wouldn't have time to drink and it was a disaster utter disaster you know, you can't change yourself from the outside in you've got to change yourself I found out from the inside out and that's a message for the newcomer because there's nothing you can do I thought, we, well maybe you know, I'll try some occupational therapy and I'll build a television set, keep myself busy. <laughs> An alcoholic TV, not black and white, not small, a big color TV. <laughs> and I bought the Heath kit and for three months I sat there and I built this color TV set and I switched it on. My wife was away, they'd left me again at this time. And I switched this thing on, and it worked. Here was the galloping gourmet in living color. And he's cooking away, and he had a bottle of wine in his hand, and he's sipping the wine, and he was cooking and sipping. And I thought I'd go downtown and celebrate. And I did. And I came home rolling drunk, and I tripped on the carpet. This television wasn't even in a cabinet yet. And over went the television, and I put my head right through it, and it exploded in my face. And I cut my, my face was lying open from just a quarter of an inch from this eye to below this left ear, gushing. My chin was cut here. And again, I'm pretty smart. I said, this is an emergency. <laughs> and, and I went to the, see the best doctor in town. And that was me. I was really too ashamed to go to anybody else. And I covered myself up like I'm, I'm was, uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, covered myself up in all these towels. And I made my way over to my office. And I stitched my face up without local anesthetic. <laughs> and leaving blood everywhere. And I missed about an inch of it. And I went back the next morning when I saw there was still a hole here. And I was going to stitch this up. And here was a note from my secretary, and it said she had moved to Vancouver, and she stayed there ever since. <laughs> you know what? You know what we are talking about here. We've heard about it. There was a total lack of communication in my home. I lost communication with my higher power, with God, long ago. I lost my communication with my wife, my children, my colleagues. I was somehow protected because I worked on my own and I used to pass the work over to other people every night and they were too glad to get it. So I just uh, said, would you take my call, take my call, and I went drinking, you see. But in that house, my children were twitching. Uh, when I came home, they didn't know what kind of father was coming in. My oldest son used to disappear down to the basement and there I would come in uh, and all uh, 
shapes of uh, disaster, bloodied up, another cast on, and all this kind of thing. So it was, um, we laugh, and I think we should laugh in Alcoholics Anonymous at ourselves, and we should cry a bit, and, it, and that's the glue, I think, that holds us together in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, this whole situation and this, and this um, family breakdown, uh, you know, resi- uh, was a direct result, as I say, of these multiple personalities that I had. You see, I wanted to be whoever you wanted me to be. I put on a face for you, and I put on a different face for you. And wherever I went, I was just people pleasing and trying to be, in fact, you know, I had so many personalities at one time that I thought I might be able to go into group therapy on my own. <laughs> I wanted more than my share of everything. Like every alcoholic, I wanted more of my share of respect, and I was acting like that. I wanted more than my share of love. I wanted more of my share of power. I wanted more of my share of sex. I wanted more of, more of everything. And I was behaving in a way that I deserved nothing and I got nothing. It was just horrible. I was so, I was so filled with disgust at myself that I can remember just a few nights ago about going into a house and I walked into the bathroom, there was a full length mirror and I spat right in my own face. And that's exactly what I was feeling inside about me. Six weeks before I came to you, I was in the hospital and one of the senior surgeons collapsed right in front of me. He fell down at my feet and he had a complicated bowel obstruction. He was very ill and he said, I want you to do the surgery. And I said, I'm too ill, I'm feeling sick and I can't do it. And he insisted. And I was really sick. So I retreated and I ran off home and then his wife called me. And finally she prevailed on me and I drank. Uh, what was left of a bottle of vodka which has saved more than one life and then I came back to the hospital and I did that operation and I operated in that fine gentleman for three and a half hours or so and lots of it in a total blackout and I'm glad to tell you he's very much alive today and a good friend of mine but you know the insanity of alcoholism but I remembered walking out of that hospital and I was shaking like a leaf because my wife said, I'd said to my wife once, when she said, you can't go on like this. And I said, oh, I could drink, I could operate better drunk than some of those people could sober. And I don't think any of you would make a remark like that, would you? <laughs> and here I was, and I made an intelligent decision again. I decided I was going to give up surgery and go and and go into full-time drinking. And what I'd actually decided to do was to go and kill myself. And I couldn't do it. And I moved out to British Columbia and I tried to drink myself to death. I broke my arm in another accident and uh, I was brought back into Lethbridge in this pitiful state. And um, I remembered I remembered a young journalist, Jim Maybe, who's, who's since passed on and he became my first sponsor. And two years before I came to you, I was sitting there having a drink and I noticed that Jim used to be a straight jacket, insane two-fister like myself, and he wasn't drinking. And I said to Jim, uh, you don't drink anymore? And he said, no, Tom. He said, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous a year ago and I don't drink anymore. And you know what I said? I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> and it was, it was Jim, it was Jim, uh, I wasn't fit to make a telephone call, but it was Jim that was called for me that night. And I got on the telephone, and I want you to listen to this, because he said to me, have you been drinking? And I said, of course I've been drinking. He said, how long have you been drinking? I said, I've been drinking for weeks. And you know what he said to me? He said, I'll be right over, Tom. And I I think if he hadn't come over that night to me, I don't think I would be alive today. 
because I don't know if I would be, if I would have made that next call. And I always think of Jim, and I went to see him before he died of uh, brain surgery. And um, Jim used to tell me, go back and tell those turkeys and alcoholics anonymous to be gentle with themselves. That's what he told me before he died. He said, we're too far too hard on ourselves. Jim took me to that first meeting, and I'll tell you, I was not impressed. I went to the chapter house down there, and I thought I was back in kindergarten. I didn't even have decent furniture. I'd been thrown out of worse places. But it was the things on the wall that got to me, like keep it simple, think, 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 uh, first things first. And then there's one down there above the clock, and that's the one that made me want to throw up. It said, isn't it swell to be here? <laughs> and here I was, I thought I was at the end of my life, and an old man is also dead, Mel friend, he walked up to me, and some of you may remember Mel. But uh, Mel used to give a penny to everybody that he saw at their first meeting, you know. And he came over to me and he put his arm around me and I didn't like it. And he told me he was really pleased to see me there, and really happy, and I really didn't believe him. And then he said those magic words, we we'll love you. And I was looking for the back exit to escape. <laughs> and he gave me this penny, a penny from a friend, he said. And uh, I still got it today. I never had a drink after that night. He gave me the big book. You know, he, he strung together three words for me. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. I never heard them put together before. And he explained that to me. All I remember of the first meeting was there was a guy sitting across the table. Oh, there was a patient on this side, one of my own patients. And I turned around and, and he looked at me. And I think he was scheduled for surgery and he didn't show up. <laughs> but there was a man across the table from me and he had the biggest, whitest eyeballs that I'd ever seen for years, looking in at mine, you know. And I wanted his eyeballs. <laughs> and I heard them, I heard them reading something about, and you're willing to go to any length to get them, and I was. I really was. <laughs> and that was all I remember of the first meeting. They could have been talking Arabic as far as I'm concerned. I had my cast in my arm, and boy was I a sick cat. Anyway, they said, read this big book, Mel said, and you know your colleagues will learn to respect you. Well, they were walking over me in the street. One of them said to me once, what happened to you with the other broken arm I had? He said, did somebody step on you when you were crawling out of the bar last night? <laughs> now, that, that's not healthy, is it? So here was Mel telling me, and I thought the man was totally insane that I would ever get respect from my colleagues in that town. And anyways, he gave me this copy of the big book, and I took it home. And he told me to read it, and I opened it, and what does it say? The doctor's opinion. Now, who the hell needs the doctor's opinion, you see? So I skipped that bit. And then Bill's story, and I didn't know Bill. I such a self-centered, you know what, I moved on to, there is a solution. Well, I've gone back, and I've read the doctor's story over and over and over again, and I don't think there's a word of it should be changed, about this obsession of the mind, this allergy of the body, you know? I have a friend, he, he goes into hospital, the nurses say to him, what does this mean, you're allergic to alcohol? And he says, well, I break out in spots. And she says, what kind of spots? He says, well, spots like Montreal, Saskatoon, <laughs> Vancouver. They told me to come to meetings every night for 18 months. That wasn't a 90-day case, obviously. <laughs> and uh, and I was too dumb. I did it. I was so dumb. And I'm so glad. Because I've buried so many people that are too smart for this program. They're too damn smart. And I see them one day and I, they tell me, I can't believe alcohol can kill me. And five days later, I've seen that very same man dead. Frozen dead of alcoholism. And I've seen many people 
lying there, purple and blue, that I looked in the eyeballs and I tried to carry the message. And we are lucky people, you see. Why am I an alcoholic? Stick around and you'll find out why me and why are they six feet under. You know, I was encouraged at the time to get as active as possible. And they said, do this, do that, do the next thing. I stuck around my 18 months. I really did. And uh, one night I got a telephone call about three in the morning, and it was a local disc jockey. And uh, he called me and said, are you the alcoholic doctor? Well, I said, I've been called a heck of a lot worse at this time of the morning. And I said, what's your problem? He says, there's a young man in North Lethbridge who's got a shotgun and he's going to kill himself over alcohol. Would you go and see him? So I dressed, and I don't advise it. I went alone, and I went over and I saw the light, and I walked into the back and into his kitchen, and there was the loudest explosion I've ever been close to in my life. And he blew away the kitchen cabinet, the whole that size, above my head, just above my head. And it was then that I realized what an asset it is to be five feet four. And she saw. <laughs> Jim, Jim told me about the powerlessness of the first step. I had no problem. I told him my life was unmanageable. I had no problem with insanity. When I was drinking, I could get anxious, depressed, paranoid, scared, any, any manic, any way, any mental disease, I could mimic it and live it. And you know the funny thing? If I stay away from Alcoholics Anonymous, I can reclaim it all back. I can get anxious, I can get edgy, I can get depressed. I've got to stay around the tables. I was talking to old Franklin, you know, and there he is, you know, um, as our friend tonight, with say 30 odd years sobriety, and they're sitting here, and thank God for them. Thank God for these people. You know, because they tell me, as John told me today, when he shared the story of a friend with a dying husband, loss of a son, 30 years sobriety. Back to the basics was her message. Love in the program, strong in the fellowship, and it just pours pours out of these people. And what can be achieved through this staying around is just truly a miracle. Now when it came to the power, you know, finding a power high, greater than yourself, I knew there was power in Alcoholics Anonymous. I felt I was plugged into power and three months at the table. I was looking around wondering where all the power was coming. Why am I doing the things I could never do before? How am I doing this? How am I living? I could see things happening. Tremendous power. But I couldn't come to terms with a uh, higher power or this God talk. And I envied those people. I envied those people who were calm, who could talk about a God of their understanding who could talk about how they, how they related in a conscious way to their own higher power they choose to call God or not. I just wasn't able to do that. So I traveled around, the paralysis of analysis, I called it, going nowhere. And I went down to see old Father Barney, another old father of AA, and uh, Barney looked at me and listened to my blurb, and he says, Tom, I have one piece of advice for you. He said, go and hang your brain on the line for a year to dry <laughs> and come back and talk to me. And I wanted to punch him in the eye. And he was right. And I came back in a year's time and I said, how do you make a decision to turn your will and your life over to God? And he said, you took Latin. De to decide is not to add something on. Decidere means to cut something away. It's a pruning process. Deciduous trees the leaves fall. Decision is to cut away. He says, you have got to cut away the things that you know are standing between you and an understanding of a God that other people have. 
and I knew what he was talking about. My younger brother's an artist in the fellowship, and he told me when Michelangelo was asked about the statue of David, never forgot it, and he said, how did you ever visualize such a beautiful piece of art as that fantastic statue of David? Michelangelo said, I cut away everything that wasn't David. I cut away everything that wasn't David. And that was the job that Barney sent me about. And the fourth step, I think I came closest to some spiritual experience. Because when I sat down and wrote my fourth step, my inventory, I could see the phoniness, the filth, the deceit, the infidelity, the cruelty, and the pain of me and alcoholism. And I saw myself like glass. And do you know, if some of my patients could only have the insight that this fellowship can give, every human being should be a member of Al-Anon. Every human being. There's not one person I've ever met who isn't being affected in some way, directly or indirectly, by alcoholism. Children, brothers, everything. Doctors, employers, and the whole works. You know? And um, this insight is what saves your life. And Socrates said hundreds of years ago that the unexamined life is not worth living. And I believe him. And if I died the day before I came to AA and they put that in my tombstone, Tom Melling's life wasn't worth living, I would have no argument with that. Because I had no idea of what was within me. None at all at that time. It took me far too long to do my fifth step. It took me five years. I did it in a parking lot with a priest in the fellowship. And I spilled my guts to Joe, and I told him everything. And why did I do it? I did it because I was told that the power of the past will destroy you. And if you get to that stage in your program, you might drink again. And I spilled it all out, and he says, Tom, you know, that's not all as bad as you think it is. It wasn't a big deal. He said, but I see you've got a problem with God. And he said, and I think he's broadcasting on FM and you're tuned into AM. He says, but keep fiddling with the knobs, he says, because I think you're going to get it, you know. When it came to shortcomings and character defects, steps five and six of the program, I went through the most painful period of my life. You see, Mel's prophecies had come true. By this time, I was the chief of surgery in the hospital, 150 doctors. I'd built myself a little garden of Eden in the valley, a little farm. I had horses, dogs, cats, a la dog, a la cat. I had it all. <laughs> and my wife and I still had no communication whatsoever. We couldn't, we couldn't get it together. She wouldn't go to Al-Anon. And I was... I was three years into sobriety, and she said she was going to go off to university. So I stayed with the four children from 17 down to my little eight-year-old. Well, they were younger than that at that time. But I stayed with them on the farm, and she went off to university. I was trying to do my practice. I was trying to do the growth. I know what this single parent parenting is all about, you know. I found one of my kids in the washer-dryer once when I came home. They were playing at the time tunnel, and he was spinning around with his eyeballs sticking out. I don't know how... <laughs> I don't know how they lived, you know. But anyway, they lived, and I did my thing. And uh, I opened my mail on January 29th, 1977. And when I opened the letter, it said that my wife was not coming back. And she never would. And she never did. And I was crushed. 
I was totally, I was crushed, I was angry. I was angry at you and your promises. I was angry at me, I was angry at her. I was angry at everything. And I went into what my friend Mac Cheetah, the late Mac Cheetah, called one of the deserts of his life. I'll speak about Mac later in a minute. But Mac Cheetah's son died of cancer. And Mac died of cancer. And he told me, Tom, if you just get your nails into the table of Alcoholics Anonymous, he says, and hang in, those people will love you well. And they'll, and they'll get you out of this, you see. And through that desert that I, the blackness and, and all of the crying children and all this thing, my boys were old enough and they elected to stay with me. And then came the day that my eight year old little blonde daughter had to be taken away. And I held her in my arms so tightly, I can feel it today. I almost suffocated. And I said, if there is a God, I want to die. Because I built my life up once already, and I don't think I have the strength to do it. And I really don't think I want to do it. But you gave me my answers. And you, and you healed me again. And I recovered from all of that. And through the experience, I didn't meet any judgmental God or get any understandings like that. I met a loving God who was suffering with me and weeping with me and healing me. And I've been comfortable ever since with that God that I have of my understanding today. You know, when you're in pain and many of you are in pain right now, you might want to point a finger and blame it on God. And, you know, I was a surgeon. Here I am, a surgeon, operating on people and causing pain. I knew I was causing pain. But I always operated on people to improve the quality of their life or the quantity of their life. And the last thing in my mind was to cause them pain. And I feel today that, my God, it's the last thing on his mind to cause you pain. I got a new insight into Alcoholics Anonymous. In step one, I had a disease. And in step two and three, I picked my surgeon. And in step four, we did our investigations. And in step five, I sat down with my surgeon and another human being, and I gave informed consent. And then I got the knife. And I've been a better person since for it. But that's what it's all about. Grace mentioned maturity today. I think I matured a bit. I think I began to think a little bit more in an adult way. And uh, I was asking a little kid once, what do you think is the difference between a child and an adult? And this little kid said to me, an adult is somebody who stops growing at the ends and starts to grow in the middle. And that's not too bad. And you know the making of the amends is part of the healing after the surgery. And if you, it's not apologies. If you go to work every morning and you tell the boss, I'm sorry, you'll fire, you'll get fired. You gotta change your ways. This man kept coming late for work. Boss said, what's wrong? He said, I can't sleep at night and I oversleep in the morning. He said, well go to your doctor. He said, and get yourself some, some sleeping pills. The doctor said, take a pill. So being like us, he says, one's good, two's better. A couple of pills. Got up in the morning, out to work. And it was quarter before the hour. And he went to the boss and he said, well, look at me today. He said, I'm 15 minutes early. And the boss says, yes, but where were you all day yesterday? (laughs) I don't, I don't want to talk too much about doctors. (laughs) There's often one or two out there, and there should be a lot more out there. (laughs) My son says there's only one difference between a doctor and a highwayman. A highwayman gives you the choice, your money or your life. The doctors will take both. (laughs) 
I was down in the United States uh, last weekend and uh, said to this doctor um, who had done an operation, I said, what did you operate on that guy for? And he says, for $4,500. <laughs> and I said, I wasn't asking you that. I said, uh, what did he have? He says, I think he's got about $4,500, <laughs> you know. I'm not being I'm not being too not being too critical, but uh, I have a funny feeling if you went to a doctor down there and you told him you had shingles, he would try to sell you aluminum siding. <laughs> I do have one belief, and it's a serious one about doctors. I think every single alcoholic should have a psychiatrist. They badly need your help. I love the theme, living sober, happy and free, but there's a path to freedom, and the path is the path of the 12 step steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, you can't be free if you're not able to love, and I wasn't able to love. And you can't love if you're not healed. You can't, you can't heal in hate, resentment, anger, Frustration. You've got to get healing. And you can't heal unless you can forgive. And I couldn't forgive myself. And through the program, I learned, and through my, my desert, I learned to forgive other people. And through learning to forgive other people, I learned to forgive myself and that my higher power had forgiven me. And then I began to heal. And then I began to love people. And I could love my ex-wife. I could love my children. I could love all the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, Al Anon, Al I take you all as a group. And I could love my patients. And I could love going to work because I liked to do what I was doing. And that's a gift. And when you're able to love again, you're free. You're standing out there in the sunlight. You've got that freedom from bondage, and there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut to freedom. And joy goes with it. Sometimes you're so good, you just can't believe it. But that is the road that I felt that I had to follow. In step 10, we continue to take inventory, and when we're wrong, we promptly admit it. In step 11, Sought through prayer and meditation to improve a conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. What a mouthful. What a mouthful that is, you know. And how do you pray? You know, how can you pray? I didn't know much about praying, but you gave me a prayer. You gave me the serenity prayer and I said it a thousand times. And I say it to our, our latest and newest member. Use the serenity prayer. Pray for the serenity to accept and the guts and the courage and pray for the wisdom. You're only praying for two things. Knowledge of a little bit of God's will for us and the motive power to carry it out. God doesn't need my prayers and I'll tell you he didn't like my directions for a lot of years either. <laughs> but I'm quite comfortable praying. As a matter of fact, I have some serenity prayer cards. You have to be sober to be able to read them, the three-dimensional. And I love the peace prayer of St. Francis. And as I said, as I warned you, I might break into song, and I don't usually do this. But I'd like to share that prayer with you in a special way right now. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring you love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. 
And where there's doubt, true faith in you. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair in life, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. O Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, in giving to all men that we receive, and in dying that we're born to eternal life. I want to... I want to share another insight I got in Washington into family recovery, which was new to me. And it was not the application of the steps to the family program, it was the application of the traditions. And this is what I heard. I heard our common welfare should come first, that family recovery depends on unity. I heard for our family purpose there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our family conscience. I heard that parents are but trusted servants. And I heard that today again. We have gifts of children. I heard that every family member should be self-supporting through their own contributions. You can smile. I heard that family relations are based on attraction and not promotion. And I heard that the spiritual foundation of our family is to place principles before personality. And I liked it. And I wanted to share that with you today. They say if you stay this long in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to witness many miracles. And I'm going to share one or two miracles with you. Bill Wilson's recovery was a miracle. Dr. Silky was a gutsy little man, Dr. Silkworth, who stood up before the medical community when there were less alcoholics and would fill this corner. And he stood before the AMA and he said, Alcoholics Anonymous have the answer to this problem. And that takes courage. And that takes wisdom. And he witnessed the miracle of the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you stay around and if you don't have a God, use Bill Wilson's God for a little while until you find your own understanding. Bill Wilson had a sudden spiritual awakening. Mine was more the reluctant variety, the slow, retarded growth, you know. I'm always reminded of this mother who's trying to wake up her son to go to church on a Sunday morning. And she says, son, go, please go and get up for church. Please. And he said, give me, he says, she says, son, please give me two reasons why you won't go down to church. And he says, well, I'm exhausted and nobody down in that church likes me. He said, you give me two reasons why I should go to church. She says, well, you're 55 years old and you're the pastor of the church. (laughs) One of my sponsors is a United Church minister. I have a number of sponsors. But uh, he was telling me, that uh, he's had so many shotgun weddings in his church over the last couple of years that he's going to change the name to Winchester Cathedral. (laughs) In in 1979, uh, my mother wanted to come and visit me. And um, my sister told me, don't bring her to Canada because... uh, 
She's 80 odd years old and that'll probably kill her, you see. And um, I went ahead and I brought my mother over and um, she was the worst case of terminal alanonitis that I've ever seen in my life. Within two weeks, I wanted to kill her, you know. <laughs> she thought that all her beautiful sons had been turned into rotten alcoholics uh, 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 by these, these terrible women, you know. These women were responsible for everything. And I dragged her to Al-Anon, 80 yards, and I stuttered, I said, you got to listen to this, and shaking her up, you see. And, and uh, you know, I, I, always, um, I always have a dig at, uh, at Al-Anon, the one myself, I think it's quite funny. A fellow was saying that uh, he thought that the first alcoholic was Cleopatra, because she was the first woman of denial. <laughs> <laughs> But my my friend Dr. Paul of the big book, you may have heard Paul, he told me who the, far, the first alcoholic was. And this makes sense. He says the first alcoholic was Eve. He says, you think about it, the apple story doesn't wash. She was heavily into the cider. And she was walking down the garden and she was having conversations with snakes. He says, what are you talking about? <laughs> He says, what do, you, what do you call this? That makes more sense, you see. So that's why we thought Adam was the first Al-Anon, and we called our group the Adam group of Al-Anon. And I was thinking of, of um, after they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, after Paul told this story, and Adam went down, and they were past the Garden of Eden, all covered in weeds with Cain and Abel, and he would say, there's where your mother drank us out of house and home. You know? Paul and I went to a meeting down in uh, Missoula and it was called Not Tonight Dear. It was about sex and alcoholism. And Paul told me the reason why Al-Anons keep their eyes closed during sex. He said they can't stand to watch an alcoholic enjoy himself. as bad as the, the story of the first reference of, uh, of electronics in the Bible. That's when God took a rib from Adam and turned it into a loudspeaker. <laughs> God. Now Grace told, Grace told us, Alan, we've got to soften our voices down a little bit. But this, this old uh, Alan on brought her husband into to see me. And she said, he's really very deaf. And I took, examined him and I said, it's worse than that, you know, he's, he's deteriorating in every department. And she said, well, what can I do about it? And I said, well, you could put some spark in his life, you know, I think maybe a little more sex might cheer him up. And he turned around and he said, what did the doctor say, dear? And she said, you're going to die. <laughs> coincidences. They happen every day. John and I had one today. And in 73, my mother called me and she told me my father was very ill and he might be dying. And I called the doctor and he, he said, oh, don't come right away. He's not that bad. And I was, before I hung up the phone, that voice that speaks in your head said, why would you wait? And I jumped in the plane that Friday morning 
and I was in Scotland on Saturday morning and I spent the whole day with my father and it was the most beautiful day that we ever spent. We talked about everything and he said everything he had to say. And I told him about Alcoholics Anonymous and he said, Tom, I've never met anybody in AA. He said, but would you do me a favor? And when you go back to Canada or forever, would you tell these people that I love them? And he died. And um, I was treating a young man, his spiritual awakenings that happened to people. I was treating a young man in 1980. And he was terminally ill. And he was jaundiced. And they all thought he was going to die. And uh, I saw this with my own eyes. And I told him he was going to die. And to get hold of his pastor. And he did. And I had to leave. And when I came back, he was almost completely recovered. I was 1980. He'd been in the hospital for months. And he said he had an experience similar to what Bill Wilson had. So he said it was a light and he was told that it, in his head or however, I'm not making heavy water stuff of this, it just said you're going to be alright. And he is alright. And what happened it turned out he was a doctor and he had never practiced a day as a doctor. But he's practicing today. He got started working just last year. So these are miracles. These are miracles of recovery. Another IA coincidence, I woke up at three in the morning and my mother was in the bedroom beside me and I don't know why I woke up but there was a muffled sound and I went in and my mother was going into heart failure and her lungs were filling with fluid and by the time I was living with my son Steve, by the time we got her to the hospital, her heart had stopped in the emergency and she was clinically dead. And I walked down the corridor and I was pretty sick. And I was talking to my higher power and I said, if that's the way it's to be, that's the way it's to be. There were two voices in my head. One was my sister saying, if you bring your mother there, you're going to send her back in a casket. There was another voice, a louder voice, and it was a voice of the late Mac Cheetah. And Mac Cheetah Many of you may know from Winnipeg whose son died of cancer of the leg and he himself stood at the podium when he was dying of cancer. He propelled me into a new dimension, the eternal dimension of Alcoholics Anonymous because Mac would always say, this is too big a deal for one lifetime. He said it over and over again, too big a deal for one lifetime. He says, you know, Tom, he said, if love is really love, it's everlasting love. It's eternal love, or it's not love at all. He said he believed that love was stronger than death across the podium. Beyond you, beyond the program, he spoke before he died. And he said, I know that I walk with my boy in the sunlight again. That love is stronger than death. But the phrase that was in my mind in the hospital that morning was Mac's phrase to me. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. He kept saying it. And it went over and over in my mind. And suddenly down the corridor a young doctor ran and zapped my mother with electricity and all that. And he said, your mother's heart has started to beat again. And I said, Vern, that's impossible. She was full of fluid. He says, it's not good, but at least it's been. She recovered consciousness. She lived for another ten months. We took her home to a wee house in Scotland, where she wanted to be. And the miracle is she got the program. She had ten months of al -Anon. And she, my sister called me and said, what happened to my mother in Canada? And I said, her heart went. And I said, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> she says, she's phoning us all up. And she's, Telling all these horrible people, his wives and me, how much she loves us all. And it's driving us all crazy. <laughs> and in another AA coincidence, I picked up the phone in October. And I spoke to her and she said she had a lovely day. 
and she'd listen to music and the last thing she said before she hung up the phone was, you made my day. And she died that night. Another AA coincidence. My younger brother, the artist, went into drugs and alcohol. He went to London. He ended up fighting with the police. He ended up in a prison in London, in Brixton Prison. And I flew to England, and I flew to that lousy prison, and I stood outside, and he was so badly beaten up, I stood outside in the rain for a week. And they wouldn't let me in to see him. They had a new excuse every day. And I said to him, have you a problem with alcohol? And he said, yes. I said, would you come to Canada? And I got him through the court. Would you go to an AA meeting? And he said, yes. And I took him to the Chinook, the North Group in Lethbridge. And I sat powerless. And I watched you people work for an hour and he didn't say a word. And he walked out of that meeting and he jumped three feet off the sidewalk and he said, Tom, that's what I've been looking for all my life. And he's been sober ever since 1976. That's love and that's power. Today, he's the cartoonist with the London Times, the biggest newspaper in the country. From the gar- and came from the garbage can. In 1978, I spoke in Kalispell, Montana. My wife had left me in 1977, taking my daughter. And I finished speaking, and a beautiful girl, most beautiful woman came up to me, and she said, I identified with what you said. And I said, we're going for ice cream. Would you like to get your husband and come with me? And she's gorgeous, you know. Teresa would be with me today, only uh, her father's just gone through heart surgery. I call her my American Express. I never leave home without her, you know. (laughs) But anyways, she said, I don't have a husband. And I'm getting smarter now because... I said, I'm really sorry to hear that, you know. (laughs) And Teresa had three children after the Vietnam War, and uh, we were married in 1982. She had four and a half years of Al-Anon before she, um, in her single time, uh, became a candidate to join the good old program of AA, and she's uh, 11 years of sobriety this year, this August. And she has done wonderful things in my life. And she's done wonderful things for my children and her children. And it's been a joy uh, to watch it grow. You know, when you talk about your kids, and I want to come to that for a minute, you know, when I hear people say they've got perfect children, you know, they've got lovely children, and there's all everything so wonderful, I said, well, number one, they must be living awful far away. (laughs) Or they're liars. Because I needed all the program that I could handle and all the the Al-Anon and everything. And I slept up this last few months in my Al-Anon because uh, one of her boys went into four months of his his finish of alcoholism. I understand he's going to meet him now. (laughs) And it was hell. And I didn't handle it well. And I'm kind of ashamed of my, I'm kind of ashamed of myself in a way of my program. Anyway, what's happened to me? Everything I dreamed of and more has happened in my life has come true. Two years ago, I decided to write an exam and I went down and I became a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and I went to San Francisco and they capped this little drunken turkey down in the city hall in San Francisco. I became this year the chief of staff, one hospital, and the first of the year I became the director, clinical director of cancer services for the Southern Alberta. And I work now half-time with terminal cancer patients, and I couldn't do it without the program. I was asked a week ago to be the medical consultant to the government of Alberta on issues of alcohol and drugs. 
and most important of all, I went through heart surgery in March. I went through balloon uh, angioplasty. And I lay on the table for two and a half hours, start naked and freezing, and I wait while they put that thing into my heart, and they blew up the balloon, and when you're lying there, the only thing you're thinking about is to be back in the arms of the people you love. You don't own anything when you're lying there. And I include you when I want to be with the people I love. And I'm most grateful that I have a loving God today, a God who loves me exactly the way I am right now, but too much to leave me this way. The way I am, but too much to leave me this way. And for that, I'm the most grateful. And in carrying this message and practicing these principles in all your affairs, a friend of mine says, if you're having trouble practicing the principles in all your affairs, maybe you're having too many affairs. <laughs> and think about it. I always think of uh, Mother Teresa of India who says you can't give what you don't live. She says we're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful to each other, to our group, to our family. And uh, that's, what, that's what carrying the message is all about. Success is not what you have. Success to me is what you've overcome. I always finish my talk by speaking about my father, the coal miner. Because when I was young, he used to show me coal. And he, and he told me, and I didn't understand it. He said, on sunny days with the sun shining, and the trees flourished, and they fell, and over the centuries they went underground, and he had hundreds of hours to dig that coal. He said, and look at it. It's dead, cold, tasteless, inert, useless stuff. He said, but you put a spark to it, and there's a flame, it lights a fire, and it returns, it's a miracle, that centuries-old debt of light and heat. And when I come here, I come to tell you that my father loved you. I come to tell you that my father that I know today loves every one of you. And I come to return my debt. I was dead spiritually till the 13th of April, 1972. And there was a spark in me, and I know where it came from. And I came to you, and you lit my fire. And I come to return my debt to you of light, experience, and try to be transparent so that it will come through. And I return to you my debt of warmth, the debt of love that I have for every single one of you. And God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.